Okay, let's get started. So we'll uh, get you guys nice and awake this morning. I'm Eric Swartz, WA6HHQ, and Wayne Burdick uh, and I, and he's N6KR, are the two Elecraft guys, along with a, a very good crew supporting us at the company. We uh, are now going in, I think, our 21st year. We started uh, shipping our first products actually uh, January of 99, the K2. How many K2 owners do we have in the audience here? We have a few of you guys. Any uh, KX1, KX2, K1? Uh, what am I missing here? Um, K, K, oh, KX3. Yeah, KX3. Oh, we got a lot of those. That's cool. Um, K3? K4? Not yet. I <laughs> ordered. <laughs> that was a trick question. I wanted to see if you were awake this morning. Hopefully soon to be here. I know I've got a number of people, but I'm on order, walked up at the audience. So, so what I'd like to talk about today, no surprise, is uh, our K4, which we uh, introduced back at Dayton, and we hope we have shipping very soon here. We're working uh, heads down like crazy, uh, both getting it, uh, all the parts in and ramped up in production and getting the uh, final software features tweaked. We keep adding new stuff, and you'll probably see, of course, new features we haven't even talked about, like on all of our radios added over the next couple of years. We have a lot of stuff planned for it going forward. But I want to give you a little fe uh, feeling for what's inside the radio, what we do, how it works, um, and also uh, the key features on the radio. K4 basically is uh, our latest and greatest uh, toy from Elecraft, and uh, we basically have been SDR for some time. If you guys that have the KX3s, especially in the KX2s, those are uh, direct, direct sam not direct sampling, but we direct convert down to baseband and then immediately sample it, the IQ into the DSP processor and all the back end filtering, uh, noise reduction, everything going on there, modulation, they're all taken care of at that level. So it has one level of mixer, but no crystal filters or anything like that. So uh, we've been on that route for some time. Yeah, come on in if you want to. Well, come in the back door. Um, we, uh, of course, now jumped into the, uh, the direct sampling area that we've been looking at for some time. Of course, we've had these working on the bench for a while. We don't talk about it, but uh, we managed to keep it secret at least until Dayton last year and get it out. So this is our high performance direct sampling SDR. That means we're sampling at RF. Uh, we're using uh, analog devices, uh, LTC, I think it's 2208. It's a 16-bit, 122.8 um, megahertz direct sampling analog to digital converter with very good linearity. So it allows us basically to sample anything up to just a little bit below half that sampling frequency. So basically from 160 to 6 meters. And with a couple of tricks I'll talk about, gets us up to uh, VHF, UHF with a VHF, UHF with an add-on that we have this year. Um, we cover 160 through 6, all modes, 100 watts of course. All versions of the radio have two receivers in the sense that you can listen to two places on the band or on different bands at the same time. Um, in the case of the K4, it's, um, it's uh, on the K4, it's a single analog digital converter, which means one antenna feeding the receiver. But the analog digital converter can actually drive two different uh, audio streams and two different pan adapter displays at the same time. And it's within its sampling range. You could be looking at 160 and 6 meters at the same time on the same antenna, though. That's the only restriction. Um, in the case of um, the K4D, we add a second A to D converter. That gives you a whole other second antenna stream for diversity reception or optimized two different band antennas, things like that. So those are the major differences between the two. Operationally, they look the same otherwise, besides the fact you can use two separate antennas on the D uh, that lets you, um, of course, the D lets you go diversity, too, where you can listen to two different uh, antennas on the same frequency and listen to the fade be different. As one goes below the noise, the other one might still be there. And that makes a big difference, especially on the low bands as the bands are opening up. So that's another advantage, advantage of that. One nice thing about going without crystal filters, you don't have the ripple in the crystal filter or the, the variable group delay through it for your audio files. It makes a big difference in audio. Though it's not bad with crystal filters, it gets even better with the direct sampling radios like this. So um, we also have that. And of course, we have, like our other radios, have receive and transmit eight band graphic equalizers. And now with a nice seven inch touch screen, we can actually give you, it looks like an equalizer. You can slide the sliders up and down and do all that. So it's much easier to address. And uh, one key thing for us, though, is that a lot of the direct sampling radios, basically a lot of them come from a, running from a computer heritage, which is nothing wrong with that. But if you like to have the physical controls of a radio like we do, we wanted to make sure that you had the advantage of some stuff on a touch screen. But to be honest, most of the operations you do minute to minute are on also physical buttons on the radio. And that, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go further. But one of the key things we did is we actually have, and the K3, if you guys would have those, K3, KX3, KX2, You've got a membrane keypad on there with actually the re a conductive puck on the back of the button making contact with uh, basically traces on the circuit board. 
works great, but the feel's a little bit softer than we liked overall. So in the K4, we went to physical buttons. They actually click. They have a, a similar um, rubber buttons on the front, but they're actually much harder rubber durometer, and they're pushing against that. So when you push it, you actually feel a hard button going into a hard click. So you can actually reach over and feel it, even just through tactile feedback, exactly when it made contact. So I like to operate radios by feel sometimes, where I'm operating and I'm looking at the screen or doing something else, and I know where my hand has to go to turn off the preamp or switch VFOs. I don't even think about looking at the radio. That's nice to be able to do it that way, too. Here's what she looks like. Um, on the right side, you've got everything from memory buttons across the top for digital voice recorder is built in, by the way. It's not an option. Um, CW recording also in terms of playback, record and playback, and uh, memories for uh, stuff. Uh, the next two rows are things like preamplifier, noise blanker, noise reduction, notch filter. You can pick filter memories in the sense that you can tell us for, say, four or five settings what you want your bandwidth to be in that mode, say on CW, 200 hertz, you know, 400 hertz, kilohertz for wide tuning. And you can just rotate through those, or you can, on the left-hand side, a little hard to see here, there's three knobs on the left vertical side there next to the screen. And the middle one controls, you control, control bandwidth or shift and width or high cut, low cut with that. So it's sort of cool that way. And then right above the VFO, right where it should be, you have A to B VFO swap. You can also copy from A to B, turn on spot, and also, um, what's, I can't even read the last one here from an angle here, what is that? That is mode. That's the mode button. So you push that and it pops up a mode selection on the screen where you can, you can do that. By the way, I've got this operational in the booth. We've got three of them running in the booth. You can come over and play with them, take a look at them, try to break them. I'm sure you'll find a way. We all, we're all good at that at trade shows. Somebody always finds some feature we haven't found in there that uh, does something strange at a show, especially when they're early versions before they ship come out. That's what she looks like, so I won't I'll stay on that too long for you. So some key features. One of the key things that, how many, how many CW operators do we have in the room here? So I'm sure you appreciate this in our radios like the K3. We've got very low latency, low delay through the receive channel. And that gives us, along with our pin diode TR switching, which this also has for, for you know, no relays clicking back and forth when you transmit. Um, very fast turnaround time for CW break-in, a very high speed CW, but also for fast turnaround data modes. Obviously, PAC tour, things like that required some of the newer ones like that too. So. We've maintained that, and that's one of the key advantages we've had over some of the other DSP radios out there. They have a longer, what we call fat pipe, pipeline that can make a difference in terms of delay. It adds, they process in bigger chunks, but the net result of that is you have a little bit more delay through the system too. So depending on what you're doing, this makes a big difference, but it does also allow us to add additional new features to it without adding delay to the system. Um, this is about, I think, a five time to 10 time speed increase over what we had inside the K3. It's they're pretty much one of the fastest uh, analog devices, uh, Shark family uh, ADSP chips out there. So it's running almost at half a gigahertz. We've got built-in, uh, for those of you that are into the digital signal processing side, has built-in fast foyer uh, engines for it, so we can do stuff for that to do all sorts of processing, including a new noise reduction algorithm, which I mentioned down here below, using spectral subtraction, where we actually look at the spectrum. Rather than trying, what we had on the K3 was a uh, a variable we call least mean square LMS algorithm has been around for a lot of radios for some time that builds a uh, very continuously variable filter around whatever it thinks is your coherent signal, your voice or CW. And that works because it reduces the bandwidth and gets rid of some background noise, but it makes it sort of sound like you're talking you know, through a, a narrower filter like this all the time. And to me, I always felt that was not ideal. And with now the higher performance engines we've got out there with spectral subtraction, we can actually recognize from the envelope where you actually have within, a, say, within your filter bandwidth an actual signal. And when that signal's not present, like in between CW dots and dashes, or when I pause when I'm speaking, for instance, on sideband, um, it then says, what else is there when that's not going on? Oh, that must be noise. I'm going to push down those specific spectral areas and do that. One thing we were able to do with our algorithm is actually do it better than some of the other spectral subtraction algorithms that have been coming online. Most of the ones I've seen out there at this point, when they do that, um, if you guys may have noticed this with some of them, they have sort of a sound of someone like just lightly hitting keys on a piano in the background. There's like almost a discrete sort of tink tink in the background as they adjust those little spectral buckets, if you want to call that. We've actually got a different algorithm for adjusting that that basically virtually eliminates that. So it's, it's quite dramatic. When you turn it on, it pushes the noise down, the signals jump up. So that's pretty cool. That would not have been possible if we hadn't switched the core engine on the radio. So instead of doing all of our DSP processing through a multi-core processor, which we do have inside the radio to handle all the rest of the graphic works and everything else, all of our back-end processing is on a dedicated DSP processor, which makes a big difference to the system. 
Uh, one key thing also, um, everything is referenced to a single clock in this system. That goes all the way up through our VHF, UHF option we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so everything's locked to our internal oscillator, but if you want to lock it to an external 10 megahertz, like a GPS disciplined reference, you can plug that in the back of the radio and do that too. So I know that microwave guys and other folks like that too, but also for some of the data modes, that's really handy. You guys able to hear me okay still? Is this coming through fine? Okay, great. Again, don't be afraid to ask questions. I sort of roll through these pretty quick, though I don't have a ton of slides, so I left a lot of room for questions afterwards. Um, this is the back of the radio. It seems to be this is always popular, so I figured I'd put it up on the screen so you can see what's here. If those of you who've had K3s, you'll recognize a lot of the same core I.O. You've got the analog I.O. down here, line in and out, speakers, phones, microphone. You can plug in like a Heil headset for a lot of his headsets that have those smaller 8th inch, 3.5 millimeter plugs on them in the back. Same thing on the K3. Separate paddle and key inputs. PTT in for a foot switch and of course key out. These are RCAs for your amplifier, external devices. Um, we kept a legacy RS-232. If you've got a step IR antenna, I think the SPE amps, several of them want to be able to get frequency data over that to automatically track the radio. We still keep that even though we've got USB also. And this runs separately from uh, the main USBs in the radio up here, which is nice. This is the one that goes to a PC for your logging programs, just like a K3. And also we have a built-in sound card like we have on the K3, so you don't have to have an external, external sound card for data modes. That's the advantage of not running low-level analog lines anywhere. It's basically digital from your computer to us. So you cuts down RFI issues, things like that. Uh, a couple of USB-As, you can put in everything from a keyboard, a uh, dongle for a mouse like I have hooked up for demo, uh, and a flash drive to save things. We, we plan to have it so you can save your setup for the radio. So if you're at a contest station and your buddy just screwed up the radio because he was operating for six hours on too much coffee and changed all the setups from what you like, you can plug your flash drive back in and pull it back to where you had it when you left. So that's the goal with that. Um, there's another USB-A on the front, too, so you have another place to plug it up on the front, too. A uh, nice little jack over here that supports HDMI built into the radio, so everything you can put on the screen is on a separate monitor. One key thing there is it's an independent monitor in the sense we don't just copy and scale up. Um, and some scale-ups I've seen don't even have more pixels. They're just sort of blown up um, the main screen. You could do that. But we actually can put an independent screen. So for instance, in the booth here, I've got one of the VFOs um, full screen on there with both waterfall and pan adapter, but not all the extra buttons and stuff that show on the screen normally. Yes, sir? What's the max resolution? I think it goes up to 4K. I had it on a large, um, I'll double check this, but a large, uh, I think, 52 inch Sony monitor. I was over in England about, uh, two, three weeks ago. Any of you guys see that YouTube video they, they shot when I was sort of half awake uh, after getting off the plane? Um, they handed me an MFJ mug with my tea in it. <laughs> that was pretty good, actually. I like, I like that part of the video. I, I, I think my line in the video is I'm an equal opportunity offender for coffee mugs. You can give me anything you want. Of course, they have Yesu, Icom, Cam, whatever it is. And so that was the one they handed me for the talk. So that was good. Um, but um, that, that monitor, I believe, was a 4K high-res one because it looked beautiful. We had it behind the radio at the National Ham Fest there and also in that video in the talk, and it looked like that to me, it was so sharp. But I'll double check that. I know it's obviously at least, at least 2K, but I believe it's 4K too from that. It's HDMI it automatically for the newer monitors, picks up the resolution of the monitor, or they talk over HDMI and, and figures it out. I haven't had to set my uh, scale manually since we've been using this. Yes, sir? Well, what would display on uh, HDI uh, and my Sure. Yeah, will it display an HDMI input in a television? Yeah, matter of fact, that Sony monitor was a TV. Um, it just happened to have HDMI input, so that was a good example. The TVs act just like a monitor when you use the HDMI input. So you've got those, and actually that gets the price down for a lot of these HDMI monitors. You're no longer, oh, a computer monitor. It has to be expensive, so that helps quite a bit. Um, other cool stuff here, obviously, big Ethernet jack in the back. We can remote control the radio over that. We can stream audio over that. I'll talk about that remote control in a minute. Uh, for mode operation. Obviously, you can do all the command interface. We can also stream IQ data for external programs like N1MM and stuff who want to be able to display their own pan adapter update on their screen. So you can stream it out that way too. A couple other things here. We've got the capability. Um, well, this one, if you have the, and this is mislabeled on this picture, it's an older picture. This is actually for a future VHF UHF connection. We could even put a type in there for you. We've got a module I'll talk about we're going to plug in for that. If you've got our auto tuner, you've got instead of one, you've got three antenna outputs. Those can be used, of course, to transmit and receive on any band. The auto tuner, if it's in there, remembers your auto tuner settings per antenna, per frequency within the band, and of course, per band. 
So you, once you've taught it your antennas, you forget you have an auto-tuner. It's sim similar to the rest of our radios. Um, but what's really cool is also um, you can route the receiver in the radio, or two receivers, if you've got the K4D, uh, to any of five inputs. It can be on your transmitting antenna, say it's that one. It could also be on antenna two or antenna three. And that can be per band, so you can set it up for each, each band the way you want. And also, we've got dedicated receiver input here like we had in the K3. And if you're not using external transverters, you can use this one for a fifth one also. So I can switch from two dedicated BNCs or any of the three SO239s for receive antenna input. So you can have dedicated receive antennas or just other ones that you want to use, say, for diversity. So say you have a 40 and 80 meter dipole, and the 80 works well enough on 40 to be able to hear for diversity. We turn the preamp on, maybe to boost it up a little bit. You could do that directly just off two of the SO239s also. That's just a simple selection of a row across the, the screen on the front to do that. And it remembers that, like I said, per band. Did I miss anything on the bottom there? I think that's it. Power, usual stuff we've got there, so. Yes, uh, what is GX sound? Ah, that's a teaser. <laughs> We're not doing pre-distortion in the radio yet, but we've got the path in there for that. The hardware path exists, um, so stay tuned. I'm not going to promise it until I've got it, but obviously I want to have that in there. If you look at the KPA 1500, you'll see a similar matching sample out, which has been used by some of the other radios, like mostly the Anons, that support that right now. That's been really popular. We sold a lot of 1500s to that group. So, so other key four features, I think I touched on a few of these, so I won't repeat them. Uh, wide range ATU, it's a switched L network. Uh, with, uh, we can switch the capacitor, the input or the output for higher low impedance matches. Uh, all of our tuners uh, on the K3 and this, for instance, and also on the smaller radios to, for a large extent, match about uh, 10 to 1 from 80 to um, 10 and 5 to 1 on 160 and 6. And again, the L network's your most efficient matching topology, so you're not going to get, like on T-style tuners, we can get multiple match points, and some of those have high circulating current where you waste a lot of power inside the tuner. Here you have the optimized match every time once it does it. And we memorize that once it's, it's found that. If you guys want to sit down, does anybody, anybody have seats left next to them? You got a couple seats, a couple, one, two, three, four over there if you want to head that way. Um, I already mentioned the antenna jacks and the five receivers, so I won't do that again. Um, key thing on the uh, ethernet again is we can control everything on the radio through that. As a matter of fact, I've got remote stuff I'll talk about in a second here, running in the booth where you have one K3, or K4, say I did it again here. I still all the videos on the internet from Dayton have me say K3 all the times. For 12 years I've talked about K3, isn't it? It's hard to get the brain wrapped around that after a while, but I'll, I'll get it right eventually. Um, we also support the K-Pod. How many folks have K-Pods on their K3s, little external VFO? It's the same exact knob and VFO as our main VFO on the radio. That works also on the K4 over USB. It's actually a little bit even more flexible. The K3 had a dedicated uh, plug in the front, on the bottom of the front panel for this, but that same K-Pod little box with the VFO on it and function buttons so you can program also talks over USB. There's actually an API for it if you want to program it into other stuff you've got. And that knob will, um, on the case of the K4, just plug into one of those USB slots on the back. By the way, if you run out of USB slots on the K4, it'll support a hub too, so you can plug a USB hub into it. Um, and then control that can switch on the front of it from VFOA, VFOB, to RIT, and plus I have like frequency selection, things like that on the buttons. They could be RIT on and off, you name it. Um, What's neat is you can plug in more than one of those. So you could have a second one plugged in and have one big knob for VFOA and one knob for VFOB if you want it right next to your keyboard. If you're like contesting, don't want to move your hands off the keyboard for the whole contest. So that makes it really easy to use too. Um, and we match the KPA 1500. Some folks asked us why the KPA 1500 was this size when we came out with it. Now you know. We, we couldn't tell you at the time. But uh, we designed those in exactly the same envelope. Obviously, the 1500 has its power supply in exactly the same size box. We usually put that under the table. It's a big switching server size supply for the high voltage portion of it. But uh, 1500, of course, works with any radio on the market, including ours. Direct interface to the uh, KPA 1500 from the K4, just like on the K3. And actually, we may have some advanced stuff over Ethernet, too, between those two. So I'm not promising that in the first release, but we're testing some stuff right now. So, other key thing with the stuff we do. How many folks uh, had K3s when we came out with the new synthesizer, the KSYN 3A? Did you guys upgrade it all? We got some guys that did that. That was one of the key things we did for our customers. We try to do this whenever we can. If we've got a performance upgrade, 
that both gives us a, you know, in this case the K3S, one of the key performance improvements for it, was going to a new synthesizer. We also made that available as an upgrade for our customers. Well, in the case of the analog to digital converters are probably one of the key areas on SDRs, not surprising, because uh, that was what determines our dynamic range, both in terms of linearity for intermodulation dynamic range, and also for blocking dynamic range. What's the maximum range we can handle from strong signal, single strong signal to the noise floor? Um, we do great right now. The K4 is 130 dB of blocking dynamic range out of the box for that, so it does very well. Um, in the case of the uh, third order IMD dynamic range, you're right in the hundreds where we were with the other radios. Anything in that range. I mean, to be honest, when you're plus or minus, well, anywhere from 110 to 100 is going to sound the same to you because getting signals louder than that. Um, they're going to be so close to you usually to causing a problem. Their sidebands and things like that are going to cause you a problem before that starts to beat you up. But that said, INDs are going to get better. And the key thing is we can improve even stronger signal handling if you need to do it. Usually it's for the field day de-expedition crowd more than anything else. You always want to make that better if you can. Um, so say down the road we have 18-bit ADDs that are available that have better linearity. You can get more bits and not better linearity, so you have to be careful about that sometimes. Linearity is basically if you um, have a signal go up, you know, in, and we want a straight line transfer function in, as in terms of what we measure in the digital numbers that we get from the analog to digital converters versus the actual voltage in. You'd like that to track exactly and not have any variance along that line, but nothing's perfect. So every analog to digital converter has a linearity spec, and sometimes they fool you. There's a double speed version of the ADD that we have, and if you run that, it only picks up about a dB of dynamic range if you actually use it. It's not some giant speed up thing like you'd hope for. So that was because their linearity didn't improve as you, as you did. If anything, it was about the same. So you really were limited from an IMD dynamic range standpoint. So newer versions come out because over the life of this product, we tend to keep our products in the market for anywhere you know, from seven to 10 years. In the case of the K3, about 12, um, or K3 to K3S. We want to be able to give you upgrades along that time if the technology becomes available rather than having to buy a whole new radio. That keeps obviously some loyalty to us from our customer base, but also allows us, as we develop new products, to try out the technologies on the existing radios and see where we can push them to, which works out real well for both of us. So when new ADDs come out, say in six years, whatever, pick a time frame, and we actually see there's a, a noticeable performance boost on that. Both of the analog to digital converters for the K4, the single one, or the K4D are on plug-in cards. You basically have the LTC2208, a very high speed, Altera, which is now Intel Field Programmable Gate Array, running the direct digital down converters for a couple of receive channels plus a uh, pan adapter channel, wideband pan adapter channel coming out of that. A very fast uh, microchip uh, MX family 32-bit uh, PIC that basically even does the pan adapter um, FFTs right there on that PIC real time and streams off just at a lower data rate, the dB per bin data we call it per frequency point on the screen to wherever you're looking at it. Um, that's all done on each of those cards. So as that technology improves, and we want to give that out as an update, that'll, that'll be available too, we hope. So we do that all across the radio. And of course, if you're upgrading between these different versions of the radios, I mentioned K4, K4D, I'll go over K4 HD next here. Those are all easy upgrades where you're basically plug-in modules. You don't have to totally rip apart the radio to plug them in generally. So you might pop one thing out of the way and then drop it in, but that's about as hard as it gets. So a screwdriver and your hands are all you need to install any upgrades on these. So you can start with a basic K4, then you find, hey, I want to do diversity or I want to do more optimized two antenna stuff for my receive antennas. Um, then you can go to the K4D. That's actually our most popular one that's getting ordered right now. And then the K4HD for the extreme case, and this is pretty much most of us don't run into this, but if you are a de-expedition on a beach running verticals and you've got people running CW on 20 meters, sideband on 20 meters, and digital nodes on 20 meters all at the same time within eye of sight, and they're all running a kilowatt and a half. That pushes any radio to its extreme. And the K3s do well in that environment. You'll see a bunch of them in operation on the K3Ss with our amplifiers down on uh, Orkney Island here, right around the beginning of the year. So that's the next big, really big rare de expedition going down into the Antarctic. And that one will be all those. And they're on basically verticals down there for that, because it works well near the water. But you don't get any side front to side isolation for them, so they, obviously our radios do well there. The K4D adds an additional 10 dB up to about 140 dB of blocking dynamic range for those extreme cases. That's basically descents if you're a two meter operator or whatever, and you pull up next to your buddy when you're talking on a repeater. 
and all of a sudden his signal goes away, but he's right there next to you. Well, his transmit signal 600 kilohertz away from you on two meters is overloading the front end of your receiver on your radio at the repeater frequency. That happens on HF too, but only with extreme situations, but we wanted to cover that too. That adds in a, a super hat front end like the K3 has. It has a built-in couple of wide and narrow crystal filter. We direct sample at the IF right after that crystal filter. Our direct sampling has more dynamic range in the K4 than the IF on the K3 had, so we pick up more dynamic range that way. We don't have to do any more narrow crystal filtering beyond those two crystal filters uh, for the narrow and wide to get narrower because the DSP can handle that. But basically you can upgrade all the way, so that's neat. Um, already covered the second A to D on that. And uh, VHF UHF module. This is not going to ship right when we start shipping the K4, but we've got room inside and we're testing that to make sure it has everything we need. Basically, we can um, offer a two meter, 70 centimeter, say 430 or 420 to 450 um, add in to the radio, 15 to 20 watts. That basically makes use of the um, aliasing feature of undersampling on A to D converters to get us up there. So we have bandpass converters, um, obviously, power amplifier for the transmit side, preamps, and everything on that plug in card. And that'll get you additional bands. We may actually be able to get a third band. We're trying to look at giving four meters or something like that for the people over in Europe that want to operate on that band. So uh, we may do that too. So all the paths are there. That basically runs to our A to D converters just like anything else would in the radio. So it gives us a lot of flexibility for expansion. But what's nice versus our prior products, we cut down all this a la carte stuff where you have to, you know, how many crystal filters do I need? You know, because you could add $1,000 in crystal filters. I'll get your question in just a second here. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, Yes. Uh, any possibility that it's, uh, there's a full duplex? I get that a lot. Yeah, there's a question that we can do full duplex on VHF, UHF, and I'll do a qualified maybe because I haven't tested that yet. Um, I'd like to get it there, but I'm not going to promise it until we have that out. So, obviously, for, for, for satellite stuff, that's handy on VHF, UHF. Was there another question? I thought I saw another hand here. Oliver? So, when you said direct sampling right after the crystal filter, is there a down conversion already? I couldn't hear the last half of the question. So we're doing direct sampling on the K4HD right. after those two crystal filters, one or the other. Has there been a down conversion at that point? Yes, there has. You're at 8.215 megahertz, just like in the K3. Um, the difference is the K3 or K3S had somewhere around, I don't know if it was 70 or 80 dB max uh, blocking dynamic range after that for strong signals inside the crystal filter. In the case of the K4, you're back up at that 130 or in that range, roughly, uh, blocking dynamic range. So the difference is, is that where we wanted to have narrower filters on the K3 to aid the DSP narrower filtering the radio um, for extreme signals nearby, in the case of the K4, we've got so much more dynamic range, we don't have to do that. You can just basically have sort of basic roofing filters to get rid of the main offenders that are more than, say, than a couple kilohertz away from you or five kilohertz away. And then the DSP all does the rest of the heavy lifting after that. And the main reason you don't need a narrower filter is anything that's inside of that filter, um, it's at a signal level that would actually desense or block the analog to digital converter, hit its maximum limit at 8.215 megahertz, is already going to be killing you with its transmit phase noise, with its transmit sidebands on CW, because IMD, even on the best you know, um, pre-distorted pre radios, it's going to be 40 or 50 dB down even on those. Most radios are in the low 30s. Well, that's, they're a lot higher than we're talking about here, obviously, down from the carrier. So the bottom line is you don't, go, you don't have to go overboard on crystal filters, which is nice. They're more actually real roofing filters in the classic sense, like you used to see on the double conversion radios and, and things like that. So what was this all about? Uh, did anybody see this picture before Dayton this year? We had, had this out. This sort of snuck out on our Twitter feed and it was sort of a teaser. So this was just titled, uh, Eric sitting in our demo room with some of our new toys. And of course, that was before we announced the K4, so that was obviously a main part of that picture for get people's attention. I think this came out the day before Dayton. And the thing in my hand, though, was nice because you're, I'm holding a, uh, what looks like an iPad. It's actually a Windows Surface tablet. And gee, if you look really carefully, it's got the exact same screen on it as the K4, showing pan adapter and everything else. But it's not cabled to anything. So I was running over Wi-Fi with that. And that's actually the same user interface in the radio uh, as inside the radio. So I can actually take that and export that um, anywhere and then go back in through Ethernet. In this case, I basically Wi-Fi to a little router in the room there and then that was plugged into the back of the radio. And I've got that in the booth so you can see what that looks like. And that's running its own version of UI so I can set different parameters for the display. I can be 
showing one pan adapter for one band, split pan adapters for two bands, or the other, either, either band individually, for instance. And I can even vary some parameters like reference level and a few other things locally for me, which is sort of cool to be able to do that. So basically, um, we were showing off, sort of sneaking that, hey, we got remote control too. So what we do with this is we've actually got inside the radio, uh, one of the key things we did on the K4 architecturally was design it for remote control from the first day we came out. How many folks here know Brandon, KG6YPI, he has remote hams, the remote ham radio site, not the remote ham radio.com you pay for, but the other one. Brandon's one of my engineers. He actually came on board back in the K3 days to support our, our remote with the K3 stuff. And uh, he was showing me his remote ham stuff, and I thought that was pretty cool. It's evolved quite a bit, and he's become one of our major architects on the K4, not just for remote operation, but one of the nice freebies that came along with that is he architected a client-server architecture inside the K4. What does that mean? Well, basically, we've got a multi-core Intel processor running our own version of uh, customized Linux inside the system. This is not accessible from the outside. You can't load your programs on it because that would be impossible for us to support from a reliability standpoint in the radio, but it's got lots of room for us to add stuff down the road if we want to. But the nice thing is that's running both the user interface, what we call CUI, everything starts with a K in Ellicraft land, like K2, K3, so don't ask me why, it's that Wayne likes this, so we, it's called CUI in, in, internally. Um, so what you see on the screen and also the interaction with the front panel buttons or anything you touch on the screen, that's user interface. That, and of course, if you turn a volume control or RF gain control, power control, they all go through the user interface and they talk to KServe, the server side. KServe is the traffic cop for the whole system. That's really the core of the radio. And the other piece of the radio is KRAD, which is the physical control of the radio and also TR timing. That's all handled by a, a, a pick inside the, on the front panel, but it's actually handling the RF board, the main transmit receive timing, so we have fast TR turnaround. Our CW keyer inside, because you don't want to have any jitter from a multitasking Linux system in that. Um, all that's handled through that. But the traffic cop is KServe. Well, KServe doesn't care where KUI is asking to make a connection from. Internally, it's high-speed USB between those two. But externally, if it comes in over the Ethernet connection, it says, oh, another KUI, what do you want? Oh, you want a pan adapter feed, boom, here it is. Oh, you just hit that button, okay, I'll respond to it, that kind of stuff. So I've actually got, showing in the booth, one K4 controlling another K4, pan adapter streaming real time over the network, um, real time everything, I control volume, control everything from it, I can set frequency. Uh, if you want to screw the radio up over there, you can do it from here. Um, <laughs> Gets confusing. At Dayton, we had this set up that way. One guy's carefully tuning the VFO knob over here on the main radio. It actually had RF coming into it. And over on the remote control radio, the other guy was spinning the knob in the other direction. Like, I couldn't figure out why the thing kept going the wrong way. <laughs> it was a good demo of remote control, but probably also how you have to coordinate if you have more than two people controlling the radio at the same time. Obviously, you could have two guys. One guy could be listening on one receiver um, during a contest if you're in an assisted category. Um, on a different band or a different, if you have two receivers in the radio or a different point in the same band on the other VFO. So you can do that kind of stuff too, just side by side on the bench. I don't expect you to buy another K4 unless you happen to have two of them. We're also gonna develop a K40 slash mini, sort of like we did for the remote control, the K3. It's basically the front panel with the main processor running the server side and all that stuff. Uh, not server side, excuse me, the QE side and that stuff all on, the, on that front panel. And that this goes over the network to wherever you want it to, either across the internet or across your house or wherever you want to go. That hopefully will be out later, earlier if not later. I actually have one working on the bench right now, but it's, we've got a lot of work to do on the K4 in terms of getting that into production before I can say, hey, let's finish the sheet metal design for it and those guys. But that'll be down the road too, and I mentioned that tablet. That was just a technology demo. We have that here too. It's actually running Linux in a virtual box inside Windows 10, God forbid. And then, uh, we, don't, we don't have Windows 10 on the radio, don't worry, that's just for the demo. But that was a quick way to get it up because we could just take our UI and recompile it over and that, you know, install Linux on that, put our um, UI on it, and then Brandon added a little connector to connect over, to go find my other radio over the internet and says, oh, there's Eric's radio over there, quick connect to it. So that's what we have running there right now. Um, yes, sir, question? Yes, actually the K4 to K4 or K4 Mini, which operates the same way, does eliminate the need for external hardware or software to do the basic radio remote control and streaming audio. All that's, you know, basically from the K4 Mini, that eliminates that. It might be handy in some cases, like Brandon has remote ham software. He use, his software can work with the K4 where we provide the audio transport. He connects us to whichever other K4 you want to talk to. Um, but 
Um, we don't have to do streaming audio through him or through the computers like he used to do with him. He required a computer there, but he handles remote rotor control, amplifier control, things like that. Some of that will build into the K4, but stations get incredibly complex. So sometimes there's always a computer involved for some other ancillary control if they have a complex station. But for a basic home station, you probably will be able to control everything through the radio. You do not require the remote rigs. That was a goal. You can still use them if you want, by the way. I haven't eliminated those connections. So you have the audio connections, the aux bus cable, everything on the back. So you can plug in the K4 to your existing stuff right now and make it work. It'll respond to K3 for mode, commands for mode and frequency, everything you need to do to remote control. Um, but it won't talk to a K3 front panel because the buttons are different. Everything maps differently there. But you don't need the remote rigs. Is there a question back there? Oh uh, yeah, yes sir. You. How long? Well, I've done it 12 years on the K3, which is better than a lot of stuff. Are you for about that long? Um, I hope so. Um, I basically, um, the question is how long, I'll, I'll go to the reverse order here. Um, you were saying how long we're doing, actually, I forgot the first question. I'm going to have to do the second one first. <laughs> got too much going on here. Okay, second one was how long we're going to maintain software support or firmware support, you know, new Linux builds, things like that. We're not going to pump out a new Linux build every time they pump out a new Linux update. I mean, that would be crazy because those come out fairly often. But that said, when it's appropriate, we'll build that too. The radio basically can, we'll be able to talk either through our utilities. Uh, we may even give you the ability to go directly over Ethernet to our servers. Um, we haven't decide if that's going to be out in the first thing. I have the current thing like we have in our K3s where it'll do it over Ethernet or over USB from our utility running on a PC. But that would include the update for the kernel and things like that. What was the first question? I'm sorry. Uh, just any speculation on boot time? Oh, on boot times. Yeah, my target is under 10 seconds for boot time. I don't want it to be a minute. <laughs> One of the things we've done is we stripped out all the stuff in Linux that isn't there, so it's not going out and looking for it and timing out while it's not there. There's a lot of that in that system. And one of the nice things when you do your own build of it is, you know, we'll take the release build and then say, okay, turn that off, turn that off, turn that off. We're already doing that right now. That's for a lot of the stuff we do. Yes, sir, question? When the software runs on OS X, um, The utility software that we offer, except we don't have external software running for the radio. That's all inside the radio. Are you asking for remote control? Or? My goal is to do that. That's probably not going to be written by me. I'm going to make that API available, to, uh, advanced programming interface available to some outside people for it. Because I can't do all the different computers at once. Probably the first one we'll do, if we do it ourselves, will be under Windows just because that's the broad audience. I like to have it on Mac. I'm also an iOS user, so I've got an iOS. If, actually, if there are any iOS programmers here, talk to me afterwards. Or if you're, seriously, if you, if you program in any of these operating systems, uh, primarily Windows slash iOS slash uh, Android in particular. Um, I'm only going to have time so much on internal software resources to do an initial one to show, hey, we've got a core program that'll work well for people. But I think that what you're doing, you're saying running on a Mac, we'd like to do it too. Of course, you can run the Windows stuff in a Mac under a virtual window too. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> well, it works well for me, but uh, if you don't want it, I know. If, if, it's, if it's a religious thing, that's, I understand that too. <laughs> uh, is there another question? Yeah. Answer is, can you turn on the K4 remotely? Yes. Um, there's, I believe, two methods. Uh, you can, I think you can have this in sort of a sleep mode and have it wake up on command. I'm not positive on how that one works right now. We've been, I know I was talking to Brandon about that. And the other one is, I think like on the K3, I think remote rigs do this. They pull down a pin on the aux connector to wake it up. So you can and you key it, turn it on physically if you want on off. Yeah, CW keying is important, so absolutely. It supports CW keying, actually several methods. Um, we've got uh, Brandon in his remote ham software, for instance, did one method that I thought was sort of funky, but actually it works if you're just hitting the, the button, the playback, you know, work the DX, here's your call sign, here's your 599, or simple conversational. He was actually decoding your paddle on one end, sending ASCII, and then re-encoding it on the other end. Well, that's not going to get your fist, obviously, but that, that was there for a long back. But he's since gone uh, to supporting the same thing the remote rigs do, which basically, and we do this, in, we do this inside ours too, is uh, supports the transitions on your key up and key down time, regardless if you're running a paddle or a, a straight key. And he sends that, obviously it's buffered because you have jitter on the internet, but it maintains the relationship between those edges because it's sending, basically here's the time you keyed up, here's the time you key down on each dot or dash. And that then is 
the, has the character spaces and everything encoded in that stream. So the only effect that you'll see if the internet's running a little bit slower is a longer delay. You may not get full break in, for instance, if you have a slower internet connection or you're driving along in your car and you're working 4G doing CW driving down the road single handed, but we won't talk about that. But uh, <laughs> I've actually had people do that, usually strapped to their leg. But uh, uh, yes, question? Um, over the security over internet? Oh, we've got a lot of stuff there. You, first of all, the full um, access to the radio is pretty constrained in the sense that you're not going to get to the Linux system uninvited over that. There's no, uh, for those of you that are the Linux guys, there's no shell SSH terminal access coming in over that. I have it turned on during development, but that doesn't go out the door that way. Um, you basically don't have a lot of easy ways to come in and break the radio. Um, I recommend any time you connect a radio to the internet, go through a router, please. Um, some people, and, and don't just open it up 100% to the radio. Obviously, you, you want to have specific ports opened up. That said, we can help automate that a little bit, but um, you want some additional protection for anything on your internal network before you go to the outside. But that just means plug it into the router generally, and you, and you get at least a certain level of it. Um, and then you selectively say, how much do you want to let through to the radio? But uh, we obviously harden it as much as anything else could be. Again, we've taken out a lot of those back doors that you would normally have on any operating system because we're a radio. We're not an operating system to the outside world. So that's the key thing we're doing. Yes, sir? Yes, the question is how do you automate or make it easier for people to get through firewalls? Um, some of the newer um, routers are smart enough that, you know, plug and play capability of those routers to automatically let the application say on our side, the radio say, hey, can you open these up for me when it comes on and says, I'll let those in. Um, or of course we could tell you open up port 21 and port 56 or pick a number, but that some folks don't want to do that. The other traditional way to do it is to have an external server like Brandon uses on remote hams. And you don't necessarily have to, for instance, if I use remote hams, I don't have to publish my IP address or location to the outside world, but I can still use him to connect me from the road through my laptop to it. So you could actually plug into that and then go to, go to it and have it set everything else. That's how you get through. How do you get through a router in a hotel, for instance, is a good example. And almost guaranteed you're going to have to have something like that to do it. But we want to make it easy because obviously you don't have the time to talk to their IT guy. Yes? You mentioned IQ streaming over internet. Yes. Uh, streaming, oh, IQ streaming from the K4 is streaming out. So you basically are getting um, a bandwidth that you pick at streaming time coming out of the radio um, to whatever application you're running at. And we're talking to, um, we're going to be talking to M1MM, and if I, actually I talked to him back at the Boxborough Convention in September um, about making sure we support his protocol, though he'll even support, he said, he can get us with his programming guy to do what he needs. Um, we'll make that protocol available so anybody can add that to their application pretty quickly. We're not going to do streaming in right now in terms of external stuff. Does it make any sense to support streaming in? It seems to feel like you've got a whole lot of... It, you know, I could do everything, but I just don't have the bandwidth to support that right now. The question is, do we support streaming in? That would be for your own modulation modes or running HD, SDR, or H, yeah, HP? I can't remember which one's which. Um, SDR external, I think it's HD in that way. But no, the radio already does all that and actually it would require a little architectural change to support streaming in right now, so we're not supporting streaming in because we've already got all that processing in the radio. Yes, sir? Out-of-band uh, transmit to Mars? If you need Mars, um, yeah, we could turn it on for out-of-band transmit. You just need to contact us and tell us who you are. And like a lot of radios, we can just turn it on for you with a software program that we send you. So that's the same thing in the K4, I mean K3 also. What else we got? Uh, I'll get all of you. Yes, sir? When are we going to see a KX4? Wait for me to get the K4 out first. <laughs> I'm not working on a case. We're not working on a KX4 right now. Um, we're always, if you have ideas of what you'd like to see us change on any of our radios, the KX family or, or these radios, let us know. Just you know, send emails into us and say, hey, this in the blind, hey, I have a suggestion for you. You can just send them to sales at elecraft.com. They immediately get forwarded to our tech team. Uh, we can't always say, yes, that's a great idea, or no, because we don't want to let on what we think is a great idea, because we might implement that soon. We like to surprise our competitors, too. But that said, that's how we've gotten a lot of the ideas that you see in the radio. One thing that we do, I think that's unusual among ham radio companies, though a lot of other ones do, do listen, but we actually solicit and engage with all of you guys to find out 
what you want or what we're you know obviously what we're doing wrong if we're making a mistake but more important the internet these days you find that out right away so I can't hide from that but uh, actually that's one of the best things about the internet if we actually have a product any product in the last 20 years that had any issue usually a software thing it got out the door that got past our testing I usually knew within five days that I had a problem so I hadn't shipped thousands of these things you know we hope oh, fix that turn around back in the days when we'd ship you know in the PC peripherals industry I was in years back I'd ship a product and I wouldn't even know I had a problem for four or six weeks because that you know got into enough customers and it rippled back through the distribution chain. So this is this is both frustrating sometimes because you get this cacophony of feedback. Sometimes you have to get through the noise and see what's real. But that said, once you get it, it's wonderful. So from an idea standpoint for new features, don't be afraid to talk to us. You know, we can't always say on the spot, hey, we're going to do that. But on the other hand. Um, I actually make note on my um, notepad, for instance, on my iPhone of everything I talk to people about here, because I know I'll forget half of it if I don't do it right away at a show like this, because there's so much input. But that's really important to us. Was there another question? Yes, sir. Could you say a little bit about the um, transmit screen? Is it, is it essentially the same as the K3 or directly? The transmit chain? Yeah. Um, it's running the, an upgrade on the KPA 300 watt stage, same FETs. Um, that is. Um, Got some both manufacturability improvements and some general just setup and bias control improvements on it. Um, the rest of the chain is going from, well, back up to the beginning. We're going direct um, uh, synthesis right out of the DSP. So you're basically coming um, out of a DDA converter at the frequency of operation. You're bandpass filtering that for the band of interest and then going through the PA and out through the uh, low pass filters to get out to the outside world. So that's the transmit strip for it also. So fairly straightforward. Other questions? Anything else? I think I got everything on this screen here. I mentioned the Kate Pod earlier also here. Um, we already did that. See, there's the questions. So that's it. Uh, guys, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming by. If you have more questions, grab me here afterwards. Uh, and come by the booth also. And I actually hit it with one minute left to go. What a deal. I, I timed that just right.